Adding this message, please enter your passcode followed by the pound sign. If you are a participant, you may hear music until the leader activates the conference. Conference Calling Center. Please have your passcode and conference leader's name available. A coordinator will assist you momentarily. Welcome to the Conference Calling Center. Please have your passcode and conference leader's name available. A coordinator will assist you momentarily. Welcome to the Conference Calling Center. Have your passcode and conference leader's name available. A coordinator will assist you momentarily. Welcome to the Conference Calling Center. Okay, um, the recording line is in now. Oh, thank you very much. Will you let us know when we can start? Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we apologize. We had some technical difficulties on this end. Good afternoon, and welcome to the second webinar being offered, part of the Arts and Education Community of Practice Initiative. My name is Justice Tuya, and I coordinate the Community of Practice Initiative that was launched earlier this year. Over the next six months, you'll have the opportunity to learn more about topics that were either identified by the field as topics of interest, or topics that were identified as priorities by the arts and education staff. We encourage you to participate in as many of these webinars as you are able in order to learn about issues facing the field and to help move the field forward. A posting of the webinar offerings was disseminated via the newly established listers on Wednesday, November 21st. It did not receive the Community of Practice Initiative update, and you receive funding under either the AEMDD, AENP, or PDAE programs. Please contact me, and I'll send a copy of the communication piece to you. If you want to be added to the grantee lister for future communication concerning the arts and education field, please contact Clifton Jones. You may obtain our contact information from your assigned program officer. Today, I have the opportunity to learn more about the Common Core State Standards and its implications for the arts. This webinar is the direct result of concern shared during two community of practice focus group sessions that were held at the Spring 2012 Project Directors Meeting and Evaluation Workshop. While the webinar is designed to be an overview, to deepen your awareness and knowledge of the issues, and to provide a context for understanding what may be happening in your own states and communities, it isn't designed to be a deep dive into the details and nuances. With that said, I'd like to bring two changes regarding the composition of our panel to your attention. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, both Ms. Sandra Rupert our, from the National and Sandra Rupert, Director of the Arts Education Partnership, and Diana Hudson, Director of Arts Education at the National Endowment for the Arts, will be able to join us. Instead, Mr. Scott Jones and Ms. Denise Brandenburg have joined us to represent AEP and NEA, respectively. We are honored and grateful to the panel moderator and panelists for their presence. Following panel discussion, there will be a brief question and answer session moderated by Mr. Jones of AEP. At appropriate time, you may submit your questions using the chat box available via the WebEx platform. Please help us to organize the question and answer session moderated by Mr. Jones by question to a particular panelist, if at all possible. Again, thank you for participating in this webinar, and welcome. Ms. Jones. Thank you to the Department of Ed for hosting this webinar and for all the panelists for joining us today. This is an opportunity for us to explore the, uh, the ramifications of the Common Core State Standards and, and the arts. Uh, at the Arts Education Partnership, we are dedicated to ensuring that research and policy for arts education is accessible to a broad swath of arts education constituents. Uh, for this reason, we are really pleased to participate in this webinar. We hope this webinar provides you with information to enhance the incredible work that you are already doing, and uh, I know we're all looking forward to the questions you pose today. Uh, without further ado, I will start and get uh, to panelists. We have three excellent panelists joining us today. The first is Scott Norton, who is Director of Standards, Assessment, and Accountability at the Council of Chief State School Officers. This role, he works with states to implement the Common Core State Standards and related assessments, 
entered and implemented new student-focused accountability systems. He served as the Assistant Superintendent of the Office of Standards Assessment Accountability at the Louisiana Department of Education and brings over 30 years of experience in the field of education and holds a PhD in Educational Administration and Supervision from Louisiana State University. Scott, the Common Core State Standards Initiative is considered a game changer in education reform efforts. As a result, there is a tremendous amount of information and, in some cases, misinformation about what the initiative is and what it means. Beyond publicized basic information, can you just cut through the clutter to better understand key features of the Common Core, the status of the state's implementation plans, and what's ahead, particularly when it comes to the new assessment initiative? Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Scott Norton. Um, also, extend my uh, thanks for being included in the uh, webinar. Appreciate the, the invitation. I'm glad to do it. I, I will talk for about 10 minutes, maybe plus a little bit, about the current status um, of the Common Core State Standard. I'll say a little bit about the assessment too. Um, if you're expert in Common Core, this probably won't be new information to you, but I'll try to provide a a tiny background and a, and a brief overview of the initiative. Uh, next slide, please. Heard that the uh, Common Core State Standards is a is an effort that was sponsored in large part by CCSSO and the National Governors Association. In that way, it's bipartisan. Um, you may have heard during the election season there was some political rhetoric around the Common Core, but, but we really don't think uh, that's the case. We think it's a bipartisan effort. It's, it's for everyone, and many states have adopted, as I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, if, if you know um, the, the star for K-12 for just English and math, there is a little confusion about that. I think some folks may get that mixed up with the Next Generation Science Standards, which is a separate initiative. But Common Core is really K-12 for English and math. Next slide. When the initiative started, it, it, this is another generation of standards. Most of us who've been around have seen uh, standards in the past, and so what we have now is a, a new generation of standards. And the real became obvious that there was a gap between what students know coming out of school and what they're expected to know as they go into either college or career. For that reason, the uh, Common Core State Standards were developed. Through the search, what was determined was that career readiness and college readiness is really not that, that different. And I'll talk about that just a little bit more. So the first step, uh, in short, the first step was to develop the college and career expectations and then kind of back map that down grade by grade down into the lower grade level. Next slide, please. So I'll briefly go over this. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I, I do think it's important to say why the Common Core was developed. And just as an anecdote, during development and adoption of the Common Core, I was working in a, in a state agency, as Scott mentioned, and we were involved in adoption of, and, and these reasons were very important to us as state agency personnel. First, consistency. A lot of states have good standards. Uh, they're very proud of those, but they can be different from state to state, and we think it's important to have consistency. Equity. If there's more uh, equal access across the states, uh, we only think that's a better a better thing than, than what may happen now. So equity is important. Opportunity, students' knowledge and skills that prepare them for college career in the global economy, that is more and more apparent as we go. And I'll say just a word about this. Um, as a developer of standards in a state, I, I do think we worked very hard in my previous role, but our outcome was not as clear as it should be. And, and the folks doing the development on Common Core spent enough time trying to make sure the standards were very clear and uh, much easier to understand. And find economies of scale. If then can develop that is available and useful to many states, it's li likely to be a um, more cost, a uh, better cost benefit than it's when states try to do things on their own. Next slide, please. So this is the core state adoption map, and for a while it changed. Frequently, very, very frequently. Um, it's been it's been like this for some time. Most states have done their adoption, and they're in a in a good place with that. The current lineup, and of course, it can change for adoption, is that 45 states 
I'd like to say 45 and a half states, Minnesota adopted for one subject and not the other, uh, have adopted. Um, has adopted. In addition, you can't really tell it on the map, but a number of the U.S. territories have also adopted. So the vast majority of states have adopted uh, the Common Core state standards. Next slide. It, it's a lot about the English and math Common Core standards in detail. You, you'd probably be disappointed by these two slides, but I'll just say a couple of words about the, the shifts in instruction for English and math. Um, of course, there's a lot of information out there available about that. Um, you hear about these different pieces already, or you may have heard about these different things already, or certainly it's been uh, in the news and blogs all over the place. So language art, arts, the main shifts are about uh, more use of nonfiction. Now, that sometimes gets misreported as the Common Core wants to eliminate literature. Well, that's, that's not the case. But more of a balance between nonfiction um, and fiction than perhaps in the in the uh, previous sets of standards. Students expected to read and write and distance from text and to connect all of those pieces together. That probably happened in some cases in prior standards, but it's much more of an important uh, aspect of the Common Core. Finally, there's um, a lot of talk, but, but you'll hear that about text complexity. Students are expected to read and understand more complex text than they have in the past, and we think we think that's important to be prepared for uh, for the future. Next slide, please. I'll just say a couple of words and, and keep it moving, but um, there are fewer things to cover per grade level if you're a math teacher. And if you're a math student, there are fewer concepts to learn per grade. That means each of those can be done into much more deeply, and, and the mastery can come in that way. The standards are connected in a more coherent way, perhaps than some state standards had been previously, uh, if you look at them from grade to grade. And finally, the rigor is more difficult. Um, I have two children school age, two daughters, and their teachers are beginning to introduce the Common Core gradually, and they tell me it's harder. So we, we know, you know from our own anecdotal experience that's, that's true. Uh, slide, please. Um, maybe two minutes about the, the new assessments. You've probably heard of Park and Smarter Balanced. Those are state-led assessment consortia. They are funded through the Federal um, Race to the Top Assessment Program, which is the same uh, origin of money, but a different um, program than the state Race to the Top that you probably heard a lot about. Those two can show approximately 20 to 25 states each. The, the members have changed some over time. Developing new tests that will replace the current state test for and math and we're just a couple of years away from that. They'll come in place in 2014-15 and working very aggressively to be ready for that. If you're in a state or a state agency, um, you'll begin to see pilot and field testing of those assessments fairly soon. Next slide, please. So here's the consortia map, and uh, blue is park, and um, yellow is smarter balanced. It, you can see it's kind of a, a regional basis. States have their own reasons for joining the different groups. The elements are, are going to be a little bit different from each other, um, different characteristics, but they both will measure the common core and they both will report out. We are working with, we at CCSSO are working with the assessment consortia to try to ensure that the results from the two consortia are comparable. Um, that's a work in progress, but that's one thing that we are, are interested in participating in. A couple of states are in both still. They will eventually, you know, shift to one or the other, and the handful of states are in neither. So that's the lay of the land for the assessment consortium. Next slide, please. So the slide, but the, the as I mentioned in the, in the two previous slides, the assessments will come into place in 2014-15. So every state will need to have common core standards implemented by 14-15 at least. Almost every state is a, is on a more aggressive timeline than that. You may have seen articles about Kentucky implementing early and actually assessing early and what the question what was to that. Most states have a phase in, but, but you can see some of the implementation topics that states are dealing with. I won't go through that in detail in the interest of 
Um, I think I have one more slide, please. So this kind of I just said, if you, if you look over time, you can see the adoption is passed. States have adopted the standards. If you look all the way to the right, 1415 is when the new test starts. Um, when the new tests start, I'm sorry, the common implementation will, will need to be in place by that time. And in the in-between years, you can see there's a um, gradual move from professional development, gradual implementation. So we're in the middle of the 12-13 of the school year. You would imagine that English test teachers are well aware of the standards and beginning to implement. Some have sample assessments that they're beginning to use, and then that'll ramp up as we go. The next slide, please. So I'll here for just a second. That was a, definitely a crash course, uh, and we'll have a chance at the end to do some question and answer if you like. But um, that's the basic information. If you have a question about that, you can go to the ccss.org uh, website, or you can contact me at scottn at ccss.org. And so hope that's a good overview for you and answers your question. Thank you so much, Scott. That was wonderful. Uh, now we have Scott Schuler. Uh, Scott is an arts education specialist in the Connecticut State Department of Education. Previously served as assistant uh, superintendent for curriculum and instruction for the Simsbury Public Schools and as an associate professor at California State University, Long Beach. Uh, experienced K through 12 educator, uh, music and college music teacher, and an active clinician. He's also been active in the development of the first national standards in music in 1994. He could the development of the music section of the 1997 National Assessment of Educational Progress in the Arts. He served as the president of the National Council of State Supervisors of Music. He's the immediate past president of NAFME, the National Association for Music Education, and is co-chair of the writing team updating the national standards in music currently. He's a PhD in music education from the University of Rochester. Chester. Scott got in this call. Uh, anyways, the Common Core initiative is math and ELA has served as a catalyst for other discipline-based groups to undertake review of the national standards in their subject areas and to align them with higher student expectations for college and career readiness. Among academic subjects already currently undergoing a revision of standards are science, social studies, and the arts. Leader in this area, Scott. Can you tell us about the effort underway to reimagine the 1994 Voluntary National Standards in the Arts, and is this work aligned with or informed by the Common Core Initiative? Thank you, and also, Justice, I appreciate the invitation. In the state role in the Department of Education here in Connecticut, I receive inquiries almost daily about how arts educators should approach the Common Core. There's clearly not just a high level of interest, but also a lot of confusion about this, to which our earlier Scott referred. Uh, it'll be very helpful to have a, a link to this webinar that we can offer to people in the future to help uh, get them started, at least in the path. My remarks in this webinar cover compress really two large topics. One is the national arts standards that are being developed in the center, the common core standards in ELA and math as they relate to the arts. Uh, this challenge in presenting this is really to create a concise narrative that's also coherent. I hope it'll be helpful. Slide. What's before you is uh, an outline of the partner organizations in this historic collaborative effort to develop national core arts standards. And most of my slides today were developed by INCAS, the National Coalition for Core Arts Standards, and the College Board, which has been a really extraordinary partner to us in this process. Uh, this particular slide doesn't uh, list our latest partner, which is Young Audiences. Uh, certainly having College Board as a partner, and you'll hear in some of the slides, uh, is really appropriate for a session that has an emphasis on college readiness. You note a number of updates in this slide presentation from the original PowerPoint that was disseminated. I encourage you to download and circulate this version instead because it's more uh, current and therefore more accurate. And also check the, the TAS website, which I thought was going to be displayed on this slide. For some reason it's not, but it's ccas.wikispaces.com. That should come up again later in the slide presentation. Slide. Nope, oh, young audience. And the address. I'm being able to click the mouse myself, so the address you need. 
So here are the components or some of the elements that will be in the new National Core Arts Standards. The philosophical foundations and lifelong goals paint a pure vision of arts education, arts educated citizens. The enduring understandings, which some of you who've worked in the Understanding by Design curriculum development system, Higgins and McTie will recognize, the enduring understandings, if they based on that vision, what kinds of key understandings will citizens need in order to lead a life enriched by the arts? The processes, a model that many of you will recognize from state frameworks, from the 1997 NAEP assessment, uh, is a model that the notion that in order for us to have lifelong involvement in the arts, we need to be empowered to make artistic decisions. Contrary to public misconceptions of the arts as products, we believe in the arts as a process. Arcing requires higher order thinking, which explains in part why well-taught art students become successful general students. Number here, you see model cornerstone assessments. It's a term of art, but emphasis here on assessments. At a time when educators and all of us are being asked to show evidence of student learning, we're building model cornerstone assessments into the model to illustrate quality assessment practice. Uh, those of you who are, again, familiar with understanding by design recognize this as backward design, starting the end in mind. And one of the other advantages of building in assessments is that we can generate student work that will illustrate standards, which in the 1994 version were presented solely in text. You'll see a reference at the bottom of this slide to connections, which will be presented in a web-based environment. I'll show you an example at the very end of the slide presentation. But those connections that we'll be drawing will be with the Common Core, with first century skills, college and career ready, and of course, uh, uh, among the arts slide. It's a very dense slide. We don't have time to really dwell here today. So I'm going to focus on just five elements of this table, which is a visual presentation of the bullets that I just showed you. Number one, standards are being created for grades pre-K through really 14, if you will. Uh, various policy reasons for that, one of which is that high school teachers are increasingly under pressure to demonstrate that they're teaching college-level work. Uh, one can't really make that case until one has defined what college-level work is. So we'll be working on that. The, the artistic processes I've already mentioned, and those processes, as all processes do, require a series of steps or components. We see listed here as process components, just a, a generalized reference. Imagine each of these processes listed, creating, presenting, responding, connecting, uh, each of those consisting of four or five steps. Uh, each of those steps or process components have names like imagining, making, evading, play out across the grade levels for each student. For each process component, be at one overarching and during understanding and at least one grade level standard. In addition, if you look over to the right, you see these uh, verta boxes that say benchmarked student work. For a cluster of grade levels, we're creating model cornerstone assessments which will generate student work. The pieces of student work, as I mentioned, will illustrate expected levels of practice. Then the bottom in the yellow box, you see a reference to a document that will soon be released that provides a lot more detailed background, and all of you who are interested in this topic will want to read that document uh, as it pertains to the new standards. Slide. This is a uh, presentation of the, of really a summary of what the foundations are and how we've articulated the lifelong goals. The College Board has gone through a process of looking for alignment using the language of this arts framework uh, compared to college and career readiness standards uh, it's for mathematical practice, uh, other elements of the common core of learning. And we'll go there uh, next, uh, or soon rather, slide. Here's again a presentation of the artistic processes. If you'll just click on the times, uh, we should see four bullets appear. These are the same processes that you saw listed on that complex matrix. Here again, the idea is empowering students to carry out the processes so that they can become independent, creative, reflective thinkers. Those words are important in that they obviously relate directly to college and career preparation. Slide. 
Now, one of the grist, uh, Common Core has done really educators a huge favor in ways that Scott Norton outlined earlier, providing a relatively clear and concise presentation of expectations. As any powerful tool, these can also do serious damage in the hands and minds of those who misunderstand their function. The purpose of arts education and social studies education and science education is not to support Common Core in ELA and math. In fact, the opposite is true. Common Core standards in ELA and math exist to enable students to access the arts, social studies, science, and the other fields. That's why they're called basic skills. So the worst possible outcome from the college from the Common Core standards would be for American schools to revert to a narrow 8th century one-room schoolhouse curriculum of read and write and ciphering. When we look for connections, we should look for partnership on a street. This slide is an illustration of the natural overlap among disciplines, which is the best starting point when one's looking for connections. These opportunities for connections emerge from the nature of the disciplines. So the new standards will be written be their good art standards. But if you take a look at the center of this Venn diagram, you see many opportunities for overlap for connection with areas such as literature, with reading, etc. And we'll elaborate those in a moment. Slide. So as the College Board examined the Common Core and compared them to the standards drafts, found two areas of alignment, two types of alignment, if you will. First is this explicit reference to the arts within Common Core standards, and there are a surprising number of those for those who haven't spent some time reading those. Uh, an encouraging number, I should really say. Secondly, there are a number of parallels in the kinds of goals and thinking that are inherent in the Common Core as it raises the bar for thinking expectations that relate directly to the arts. Slide. Now, seeing right off the bat, if we take a contemporary definition of text, move away from less on a printed page, in the different media through which communication occurs currently, this eye of reading really extends to all arts-based content. Slide that. As one reads the, uh, through the comp standards, one finds very explicit references to the arts and arts actions. Uh, these are just a few of the examples. Slide. You can see that uh, with 100 standards of writing, there are at least eight arts links. And you see here a visual arts and a media arts example that you have received the slideshow. I won't spend a lot of time reading through or discussing the specifics. Uh, let's move to the slide. Then in listening, there are 16 arts links among only 60 standards. So you see that more than a quarter of the standards provide opportunities for arts connection. Here's an example from a standard in which there are several uh, several connections highlighted in the uh, what appears on my screen as brown color. And in language, there is one reference. It's use of dialect and stories, dramas, or poems. Theater, it's really remarkable we don't see more theater in elementary schools around this country because it's such a powerful medium for delivering language. Slide. So there's another way that we can look at for action, and that grows out of the kinds of thinking that exist. Um, we make sure that they're uh, that we like those as well, because those are again inherent in doing process-based arts. Slide. Again, at this, we see opportunities to look for college and career readiness. So standards for mathematical practice linked to these philosophical foundations and lifelong goals. In reading, we see analyzing and interpreting, which are present basically every one of the artistic processes. And well, there's investigation and reflection, which occur in the creative practice model that we'll be seeing in a moment. As connections to vocabulary, we have to remember that vocabulary occurs in a variety of forms or tiers as they're outlined in the slide. The first is of words, if you'll click again, these that are very common words uh, that may be less relevant to our needs. They're just basic vocabulary. Next. In two, please click again. Uh, you'll see some uh, more sophisticated vocabulary, and I'll show you an example of that in a work of art uh, in the next slide, please. 
and study text, whether it's in theater or in uh, in music and vocal music. We have many opportunities to do level two or tier two text, more sophisticated text, and really can't convey the meaning of the artwork unless we understand that text. So there's an opportunity to develop deep understanding connected to an emotion or a feeling tone, which makes the learning all the more powerful. Slide. There are different Aspects to learning to read. Next, uh, click, please. And you'll find that there are many opportunities in the arts to make those connections. So again, again, there are also text-dependent questions. So as a choral teacher, uh, we need four bullets up on screen, please. Uh, as a choral teacher, for example, would walk a student through uh, a work of vocal music. They have opportunities to ask questions of this type about the text and then ask the students to bring it to life through their performance. Slide again, please, and click to show the words. So you have a number of T3 vocabulary words in content areas, which are the academic vocabulary of our fields. And these are terms that will be uh, that were present to some extent in the glossaries for the 1994 standards, and will certainly be included in the new round of standards. Uh, important not because we know what they mean in terms of definition, but important because we understand their concepts and are able to apply them in our art-making slide. The creative practices, which I alluded to earlier, you can these high-level words of, uh, in the, the practices. These pervade uh, many aspects of our art-making. Certainly, the creating processes have these in it's across the art forms. And these are powerful words for preparing students for really any career, or well, certainly for college. Slide. The College Board then took a look at some of the math standards. Now, I'm going to show you a math standard in a moment. I promise you that our art standards are not going to be this long, but I have colleagues who are in mathematics, and I think there was a lot of texting that said, OMG, after seeing this. Could you click again, please? Their math standard. Very long standard. Uh, to its credit, it actually highlights a lot of very important thinking, but it's very dense material. Probably a good illustration of why mathematicians also need to be good readers. Click it, please. But in this slide is a, an attempt to highlight some of the terms that are within this standard, which relate very directly to art making, We're creating or, or performing, or even in some cases respond to arts. These things that we do all the time, and helping students make that transfer is an important function uh, as educators. Look again, please. This to our final slide. With help of young audiences, we're in an active process of building a uh, web design that will host our standards. Uh, if you would please ignore the learning strand components over in the top of the left column and substitute the words process components, you have an idea from this. Uh, how a particular standard might appear on a screen. If you look to the right, now speaking to our connections, you see places for connections to 21st century skills and the Common Core. What we envision is that when you see an art standard and there's a connection that's been identified, you'll be able to click on it and hot link from that connection over to uh, finding examples of how you can make that connection, either in classroom or by working collaboratively with colleagues. Thanks for the opportunity to present, and I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Scott. Before the final, uh, the final panelist with Denise, I want to urge everyone to, to, to make questions using the question and answer field uh, so that we have some dialogue at the end of, the, end of this uh, panel. Uh, Denise Brandenburg has been an art special, education specialist at the National Endowment for the Arts since 2006. Through agencies, art works a arts education grant category. She works specifically with dance, music, and opera education. She also managed the Improving the Assessment for Student Learning in the Arts Leadership Initiative, a national research project that includes collecting and analyzing information on current practices and in the assessment of K-12 student learning in the arts. Denise is an experienced arts educator uh, and arts manager. She was the director of art education and community programs at the Coral Arts Society of Washington, and previously served as the assistant director in the Institute for Earning Through the Arts at the Wolf Trap Foundation of Vienna, Virginia. 
started her career as a middle school choir director and drama teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools in Southwest Virginia. She holds a Master's of Arts degree in Arts Management from American University and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Music Education from Virginia Tech. Denise's part of the National Endowment for the Arts mission is a focus on arts education. Can you describe the NEA's process and priorities in this area? Take us a little deeper to understand, based on the NEA's research, what the status is on student assessment in the arts and what challenges we might face in the areas of assessment and professional development once the revised standards in the arts and the common core standards are fully rolled out. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, I wanted to thank the Department of Education for hosting this important discussion, and thank you to our facilitator and panelists. The information provided in those two presentations is incredibly helpful, and so thank you to all the Scots. <laughs> My name is not Scott. Uh, as far as projects in arts education, at the National Endowment for the Arts, make awards to nonprofit organizations and school districts, by the way. I'll let that sink in just for a moment. Uh, we do make grants to school districts in our works, our education grant category. For several years, we've been funding standards-based arts education projects that are both school-based and community-based, and that is to say both in-school, out-of-school arts ed activities. We have projects that involve direct services to students, pre-K through 12th grade, that increase knowledge and skills in the arts and projects in which student learning is being assessed in one way. We fund professional development projects for teachers, teen artists, and other arts education providers, and we fund projects that are both, direct learning for kids and PD for adults. We fund projects that involve both learning in the arts and through the arts, and or art integration. So arts integration is welcome at the moment. Projects that tie to Common Core are welcome. Keep in mind that our emphasis is still arts learning. Basically, what some folks may not know is that the various artistic discipline categories within our artwork, for instance, music, folk arts, visual arts, dance, theater, etc., we fund many other types of arts education related to life learning, outreach programs, multi general projects, multi generational projects. We have a new research funding opportunity information through our Office of Research and Analysis. You can get more information about all of those grant opportunities on our website. The NEA investment in arts education goes beyond just the arts education category in artworks. I hope you don't mind that this is a little plug to this webinar audience. If you have applied for funding from the NEA, you should. And in my talk, we'll put up a slide with the names of the arts education specialists who can help you apply and their contact information. The next deadlines are in 2013 for project support in 2014. For grant program, we also support the arts education field through several leadership projects, including the Arts Education Partnership, which I think we've been involved with for about 19 years now. Uh, we've invested in an Education Leaders Institute, and we also support two critical national networks, the Arts Agency, Arts Education Managers, and CDA. Many things, but you can find out about those more on our web website. As far as in arts education, um, I'm pleased to be asked this question because there, there's news on that front. Some webinar audience may have been present at the AEP forum in September in Chattanooga, where NEA Chairman, NEA Chairman Rocco Landisman delivered remarks to announce agency priorities and strategy for arts education. The leadership of our new Director of Arts Education, Ayana Hudson, the NEA is positioning itself as a leader in the field of arts education. So our new mission statement for arts education is, the endowment works to ensure that every student is engaged and empowered through exemplary arts education. We believe that arts education is a driver for transforming schools, students, and communities. Components of this new uh, strategy include we believe arts education should be student-centric. Our education should take place in schools, out of school, and in communities. The individual student is the common denominator. 
component is collective impact. Uh, stand and assessment are important elements in teaching and learning, and they serve as a basis of a, for language so that school leaders, classroom teachers, art specialists, teaching artists, and arts organizations can all work together. We organizations need to work collectively in order to succeed. The art element can make systematic change alone. We need the leadership of our education colleagues, and we need alliances with key organizations. The component of our new strategy is standardized data. We are leading a movement to collect standardized data across all 50 states that can test about resources, frequency, content, and quality of our education in America. Really interesting in Chattanooga, uh, Rico used the R word a few times in his remarks. Reform. He quote, the arts need to be front and center as part of every school reform strategy. We can just focus on a few select subjects and expect students and teachers to succeed. We invest holistically and completely. He wanted to mention a uh, uh, President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities Turnaround Arts Initiative, which really emphasizes arts integration. I cited several examples of community-wide and statewide initiatives that put arts as a central component of public education. And been quite interesting that while he's not against innovation, he said to actually change the state of arts education in this country, we need to grow the infrastructure that is already in place and expand it to places that it has not yet reached. This points to supporting existing system-wide efforts to keep arts in the schools. So future parity, he's thinking about collective impact. Move forward, we will be intentional in our focus to support arts specialists, classroom teachers, and teaching artists in building knowledge and skills to effectively work together. Lana Hudson just blogged about this on our NEA blog. She was responding to a wonderful post um, from Thea Gibas in LA County who did a Create Equity blog called Unpacking Shared Delivery of Arts Education. I encourage you to Google that and find that blog entry. This is an extremely important and timely discussion as it moves the conversation from working in isolation to working together for the collective good of students. Um, so stay tuned because there will be an announcement out of the Arts Endowment in the comments about a webinar outlining our new arts education strategy. So there are projects and priorities. Um, going to the NEA research on student assessment in arts. Three grant cycles, the NEA arts education staff and our panelists made the observations that applicants were not really articulating how they were assessing student learning in their projects. How did these program managers know that knowledge and skills in the arts were being increased. My personal suspicion was that many organizations are constantly assessing learning because that's what effective educators do. They were just struggling with articulating their methods and systems in an application. So we went out in California to conduct research about assessment of arts learning. We decided that we wanted to see what was going on out in the field, both in school and out of school in arts education. How were folks assessing student learning? Now, the purpose of this research was to find model assessments in the field and perhaps even share them through our website or through a publication. So we checked with key leaders in the field. They did a literature review. And through 15 partner organizations, they conducted a national survey. And what was a little startling was there were a few high-quality assessment tools that were publicly available we were unable to find models that we could share with our constituents. And the, the distinction is publicly available. It's not that great assessment doesn't exist. It's, it's out there to be shared. Part of those NAs research on assessment was the project survey of um, the field regarding assessment. In the report, the survey results were broken down into two respondent groups, uh, district and school staff, and then Policymakers and arts and cultural organization folks. So, our survey respondents were talking about in school or out of school arts learning. There were general findings common to both groups. Some of those findings include 
that as a group, arts educators and related stakeholders use a variety of, of assessment tools, mix observation protocols, portfolio reviews, performance-based assessment. What was really encouraging, actually, is the majority of the survey respondents reported that the, at the tools they found most useful uh, were created by a teacher or teaching artist. And a former teacher, I kind of love that. Uh, student assessment data are used for widely different purposes. The district and school staff folks are assessment data to um, determine student grade and to provide formative feedback. And the arts council staff and arts and cultural organization staff were more likely to indicate that they use the data for program evaluation, program lesson improvement, and using uh, the data because it was a funding requirement. <laughs> um, overall, the arts education field we found in this study is eager to assess student learning. However, the field needs guidance and assistance to implement high quality assessment practices. Some things, uh, again, along with the lack of publicly available high quality assessment tools, um, on those lines, we are finding the majority of high quality publicly available to assessment tools are created by large scale testing agencies and education agencies. Agencies. So, in general, assessments created by these larger agencies score higher for quality than the assessments created by individuals or smaller organizations. Um, you know, more than 75% of the respondents uh, they use the internet uh, they used internet search engines to look for assessment tools, but had little success. Who am has not looked for assessment <laughs> tool on the web and found practically nothing. Um, so those are the challenges that we might face in the areas of assessment. Uh, one why standards in, our, um, in the arts are rolled out in Common Core. I'm going to be cliche for a second, and instead of challenges, I'm going to use the word opportunities. Uh, things from our study indicate the need for professional development in assessing student knowledge and skills in the arts. There were training and not only creating effective assessment tools, but how to implement assessment systems to improve teaching and learning. Uh, folks need training in the difference between assessing knowledge and assessing skills. Training regarding rubrics, particularly what constitutes a rubric, how is it proper to, properly used, and what components are necessary to develop a high quality rubric. Most of the survey respondents reported receiving training on arts assessment via professional development. <laughs> Very few reported receiving undergraduate or graduate level training on assessing student learning. Respondents reported the additional training on locating and identifying valid assessment tools, rubrics, et cetera. So at the end of our report, the uh, West had made several recommendations and um, that's summarized by saying that uh, folks need information aimed at developing common understandings, sharing successful practices, and using the knowledge and skills needed to implement assessment in the arts. Uh, so February 14, 2012, we convened folks to talk about this. Some folks on this webinar might have uh, tuned in for the five hour <laughs> King that we hosted. We were thrilled to have Assistant Deputy Secretary for Innovation and Improvement, Jim Shelton, for the introductory remarks at that convening. Um, he said so many wonderful things, but the gist of what he was saying was NEA, the field of arts education, should be taking up the topic of assessment, and if you don't do it, who will? I remember one of the participants in the convening. Uh, actually said, this is the party we've been trying to have, but nobody was throwing it. So we were proud of the convening and that it started the conversation about um, high quality assessment in, in the arts. You get our assessment research report on our website. You can call me or email me and I'll point you in the right, right direction. Um, there are many other research reports on the website about arts education. As a system, not a thing. I know that that little phrase will be familiar to many of you folks. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, I will leave you with the contact information of the arts education specialists at the A, uh, who are some of the finest people I know. Thanks.
Thank you, Denise. Uh, and thank you and to all the panelists. Uh, we have a few minutes now to have some question and answer. Uh, I remind you again, you can ask the questions in the Q&A box, bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, we wait for some questions to come in. I will start off with a question for all the panelists. Um, there are misconceptions regarding the Common Core, especially as they relate to other academic subjects like the arts. To each of you, um, from your various perspectives, what, what are those primary misconceptions that you have identified, and how would you reframe them more accurately? Uh, for ease of this, I'm going to ask Scott Martin to go first. I'll, I'll, I'll do two briefly. One is that Common Core is for kids going to college and only those kids. That, that is not how it was designed and, and, and not an accurate statement. It's not training in welding, for example, but it is training for the next type of schooling that students will need. And all students will need something beyond high school. So that's one thing we're trying to clear up. Secondly, I mentioned this very briefly earlier on, uh, there's a, a misperception that Common Core hates literature and only wants nonfiction. That, that's also not true. Um, it's more of a balance, and I think we'll do a, an effort, we'll make an effort to try to clear that up as well. Thank you. Scott Schuler. Well, I to a few of those earlier. I think one of the misconceptions, really literally some administrators feel that the Common Core are the standards now, uh, and they need a broader conception of what they are. I think certainly uh, they need to understand that the thinking emphasis in these standards is at least as important as the content, as the stuff, that the emphasis on students making judgments, coming to critical decisions, Analyzing and critiquing is fundamental to the, uh, to the set of standards. It's really, in many ways, what's going to push the envelope if we're successful beyond the drill and kill uh, approach that was formally designed for the old generation of many state tests. So, uh, as we look at the arts, we see a real opportunity here for a connection to the kinds of thinking that we foster uh, in the arts of our students when we teach well. One of these. Mine are pretty simple, actually. Um, as an arts education specialist at the Arts Endowment, we just, we see applications and we get phone calls from folks who think that there is a common core in the arts. They they um, use common core and standards interchangeably, so uh, that actually is a signal that they're getting this mixed up a little bit. Maybe they know the arts standards are being revised. They, they think they should utter the words common core. Uh, but it, the misconception um, is that is that they're core in the arts, as opposed to revision of the art standards. Uh, and the the other misconception is about assessment, um, and, and uh, that assessment equals testing. Uh, I would say that it assessment does not equal testing. Um, that uh, in the arts field, we we very much um, talk about assessment for learning and uh, not just assessment of learning. Wonderful cue. Uh, I have one question in so far, uh, and I believe this is directed at Scott Schuler. Um, however, if someone else would like to answer, uh, let me know. Uh, could you please comment on the role that art museum education plays in addressing the goals of the Common Core State Standards? Is it realm of responding, language development, speaking, reading, and writing? Well, a thoughtful answer would take a little more time and thought, but uh, off the cuff what I'd say is that there is an opportunity for museums to go beyond uh, the, the responding level. I see effective museum education going on, well, effective learning in general, beyond students just looking at, thinking about. Uh, none of us has ever seen a math appreciation course. Uh, we're always engaging students actively in doing. So to the extent that museum educators create a dynamic uh, collaborative opportunity, perhaps with the local art specialists, for them to create, uh, for example, in a particular genre than they can encounter in the museum, there's an opportunity for uh, museum educators to go beyond simply that responding mode. Uh, and to the extent that students are making judgments, uh, are, are reflecting about their own artwork as well as the artwork they see. 
opportunities for reading to go on, writing to go on. And then, of course, uh, call the way back to one of the earliest slides I presented, the idea of what's text? Text in the broadest sense is a medium of communication. And you look at the history of communication, uh, go back to the old uh, Baroque churches, medieval churches where um, communication about, say, the Bible was uh, in pictorial form. And then the invention of the printing press, suddenly we went to this printed text. In a way, we're coming back around full circle. The people are getting a large percentage of their communication in the media, which are art forms. So to the extent that we encourage um, the recognition of the fact that students need to be two-way literate in all the media of communication, writing, uh, sound, uh, visual communication, etc., we really have an opportunity to show a broader connection. So I went a little beyond the, the original question, but I want to tie these pieces together. Thank you. Uh, Scott Norton. Uh, we have a question uh, regarding the development of the standards. It appears that college skills are increasingly expected of students at lower grade levels. Uh, to what extent were the core writers uh, uh, considering the age-appropriate uh, developmental considerations of younger students, especially the you know as as younger students develop, uh, that they might need uh, to be more age-appropriate and not push college-level skills. Uh, to younger ages. Yeah, I can tell you what I know about the development process. Um, the writers did did do a lot of research and and stuff out about what's appropriate for each grade of student. And I guess I would rest that question slightly and, and say that it's skills that would lead to college and career readiness, as opposed to college skills in uh, down in the K twelve. But but doubt that the rigor is will be. As standards are implemented, the rigor will be more difficult. Um, you know, there are some examples we've used of uh, literature or, or reading that might have been in the eighth grade in the past may now be in the sixth grade, for example. Math so skills get pushed to lower grades than they were in the past. And that was intentionally done. Um, we states will have to work, states and districts will have to work to build systems of support for that. But um, with the rigor is, is appropriate. Um, and I hope that we, we have enough time to get ready. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, we have one question about uh, where practitioners in the field uh, can learn more about um, the Common Core standards, at, and in particular, maybe the implementation it, within their state. Uh, both, of, both of you, Scott, are involved in, uh, with the state. And so I'm wondering if you could uh, illuminate where, where practitioners can look. Um, Scott, and again, the, the, for the standards themselves, the corestandards.org is the, the main place that the standards documents are housed, and there are some supplemental materials there are there also, uh, corestandards.org. For state-specific plans, you know, unfortunately, you'll have to go to each state's website and figure out, you know, exactly what you're looking for. States have different, um, states are implementing the same standards and largely will be implementing the same test, their transition plans are quite different. So if you're looking for transition information, you'll have to go to each state website, unfortunately. I can only add to that that um, due to the shrinking of state governments around the country, in many cases there are many fewer well and state departments of education. Uh, even at a time when the demands are arguably increasing. So being able to talk to a particular individual there, although you may be so lucky, is kind of a luxury. So I fully agree with Scott's suggestion that you try to go to the website first to find out what's going on. And departments of ed that have got their act together are using their web increasingly as, their, uh, as a primary vehicle for communication. Thank you. I actually have one uh, addition that I'd like to uh, uh, just put a plug for the Arts Education Partnerships website. Under our Resources tab, there is a Common Core uh, and the Arts Resources, uh, which provide some uh, great resources regarding the Common Core generally, uh, and then also as they do the arts. So our website is www.aep-arts.org. 
uh, we have one uh, one more question for uh, Scott Schuler. Uh, when the art standards be completed and rolled out, and maybe also how can uh, practitioners be, become uh, more involved in their development as they become uh, related? The, uh, let's take the uh, the first one first. There will be some draft material released by the end of March 2013. Complete material, however, is unlikely to be available in draft form until I would I would speculate the summer of 2013, because we're talking about doing cornerstone assessments, piloting, collecting student work, benchmarking student work. Uh, we're hoping to go through a year of public input and refinement uh, of the material, and also piloting of those assessments. So, if I were a betting man, I would say probably <clears throat> sometime in 2014 or earlier than June and conceivably as late as sometime in the fall on uh, their final form. But you might be able to work with some drafts, significant drafts, by summer 2013. <clears throat> the second part of it, um, uh, people who apply, there was a national call for writing team members that went out before the writing began. And we collected 300 uh, resumes, applications from around the country vetted uh, in a variety of ways. Those people who are not selected for writing team membership are being involved in a variety of other ways, one of which is as a reviewer, uh, there's going to be a round of, of uh, confidential review uh, goes out publicly so that people have a chance to give their frank input uh, before uh, the first initial uh, draft is released. And those people will be contacted within the next month or two. Uh, in music, we're using a somewhat different mechanism, so I won't go into a lot of detail except that we, uh, we're involving dozens of people from the higher ed community and K-12 community uh, doing some of the individual writing beyond our writing teams, uh, but not a universal practice. And the bottom line here is that, uh, a, that just in the 1994 standards, there'll be widespread dissemination uh, unlike the 94 standards where we had to do it in print, a lot of it will live online. So I would direct you again to that eas.wikispaces.com website. Uh, and announcements will be forthcoming there, and there may even be an opportunity to sign up for alerts on that website. Great. Thank you. Um, I have uh, one more question, uh, and this could go to either of the Scott. Uh, for the uh, for anything. could you address the, uh, the concern that uh, many uh, practitioners are probably having uh, regarding the fact that school may uh, may start requiring teachers in the arts to include education math content uh, uh, rather than to be focusing on their own artistic content. First, yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it, in a way, this is that misunderstanding I was talking about. Let me give you, uh, let me you two very different examples of how Common Core and the arts can come together. First, let me give you uh, that example. Uh, a make goes out that everybody's going to read for 10 minutes at the beginning of every class, whether it's an arts class, a PE class, or a reading class. And so they're re maybe if they're really enlightened, they're reading a book about Beethoven for 10 minutes. Um, another extreme example, st are engaged in process-based arts making where they engage in planning, uh, some of which may be in written form. They carry out their artwork, which may or may invo not involve text, depending on certainly in theory and in vocal music, their way. And at the end of the process, the students engage in self-critique, reflection, identify areas that they could improve, be even strategies for improvement in the future. Uh, those are opportunities where reading and writing come together. And I, let me talk a, just very quickly. I'll my former assistant superintendent had for a moment. Uh, if I choose whether students would focus on reading or writing, I would focus on writing because you can really infer reading from their ability to write better than you can the opposite. And in the arts, I think the strongest opportunities, some of the strongest opportunities for us are giving students opportunity to show what they understand or know through their writing. Now over to the other Scott. 
You know, I don't really have anything to add except uh, as a final anecdote. Um, I am involved in the, the Common Core State Standards from the administrative side now at CCSSO, but what I didn't say is that I spent the first 12 years of my career as a as a high school music teacher. Um, so I really feel like I'm like I'm tuned in and sympathetic to the well to those folks in the classroom, and I do hope we can work that in a reasonable way, as Scott mentioned. Question, uh, and I'm going to direct it to uh, all of the panelists. Uh, I'll start with, with Denise. What's the primary takeaway uh, that you think our audience of arts educators should have from the webinar uh, regarding the role of the arts with the Common Core? Uh, the primary takeaway would be to go look at this webinar as it's going to be archived on the Department of Education website because I think it has become quite the tutorial and um, really appreciate the opportunity, but I, I think um, especially the myths that have been dispelled, um, I appreciate that part, so thank you. Scott Schiller? I urge people to stay in tune through the wiki site that I've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, there is going to be material posted there very soon, developed by Common Core, uh, excuse me, developed by the College Board in a very thoughtful fashion which will provide really good guidance on the, uh, the intersection between quality arts making as painted on our, our new standards and uh, quality language arts and mathematics work as painted by the Common Core State Standards. Thank you. And Scott Norton. I would say that the, the Common Core State Standards are not intended to work at odds with the arts. And in fact, the opposite is true. And I would just refer us all back to Scott Schuler's presentation for a, a great description of that. It's the best I've ever seen. Great. And thank you to uh, Scott Norton, Scott Schuler, and Denise Brandenburg for, for participating in this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, I think it's been really illuminating uh, for a wide variety of audience, and I hope that uh, the practitioners out here uh, who have logged in uh, have found it as valuable as I have. Thanks. With that being said, we will conclude this webinar, the Common Core State Standards and its implications for the arts. Please note that a recording of this webinar and the accompanying PowerPoint will be made available via the resources section of the AEMDD and PDAE webpages at www.ed.gov. If you have further questions, please feel free to ask your assigned program officer. Thanks to Scott Jones for facilitating this discussion, and to Scott Norton, Scott Schuler, and Denise Brandenburg for sharing expertise with us. To note that the next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, January 9th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. This webinar will focus on the Folger Shakespeare Library and the Smithsonian the Enrichment Center, who will share with us resources that are accessible via remote locations. The offerings promise to be rich, so please mark your calendars accordingly. A logistics email with the link necessary to participate in the webinar should be released the week of December 31st via the Arts and Education listservs. Again, thank you for participating in this webinar, and we look forward to your participation on January 9th.